<laughs> this is our last session. Thank you for coming. Um, if you have <clears throat> been here or tuned in, you will know that there have been a whole variety of topics. Yeah, we dealt with uh, dirt poor immigrants, the first session. And the second session, uh, three teepee rings and experiences of my reflective memory. And then the third session, we devoted to the topic, at least in my vignette, I never went to kindergarten. And the fourth one, now a couple, three weeks ago, I won the lottery, question mark. And two weeks ago, we skipped last week, obviously, uh, an unanswered prayer or was it, question mark. This one, this concluding section, is you can go home, but. You can go home, but. And you will remember that we have begun each session with a, with a brief vignette. Uh, again, an example of my reflective memory. Also, just to remind you of what I said at the very beginning. Most of us are getting to an age now where we have more to reflect about. And we have also, because of this pandemic, and more isolation than normal, or we would probably like, gives us some um, space for those reflective memories and to think about it. And that's why I put these six vignettes together. And uh, <clears throat> Scott tells me that um, they will, they're up on YouTube through the church's website, or you can just type in my name and they'll pop up. I see that happens too. So I asked him today how long they would be up there, and he said, forever. Well, that gives eternal life a whole new meaning, I would say, uh, in, this, in this crazy uh, interconnected digital world. So. My opening remarks in this vignette are built on the previous one. We, if you recall, we had, uh, I had said we, as a family, had lived in England for several years and it was time to go home. And uh, this vignette sort of picks up at that point and you can go home, but. As the plane approached Seattle, our anticipation grew and grew. We had gone to England with our two eldest daughters and our youngest third daughter was born there one month before we got on the plane and approached Seattle. The homecoming was wonderful. We hadn't been back for four years. We went from one house to another, one set of parents or grandparents to the other. The children were doted on, and they loved it. We all did. What became apparent fairly soon, however, was the but. There were no sordid dramas or hidden family secrets to be revealed. None of that. But it was the beginning of a major life transition. I heard that word this morning earlier. And that transition would go on for months and months. Julie and I had been through numerous transitions before. Before coming this morning, I was gonna count up how many different places we had lived to that point. I forgot to do it, but it was more than I care to remember. But now it was transition times five. 
How would these young girls, two of whom had beautiful Oxford accents, adjust and fit in? They were clearly different. What about school for them? Where would we find employment? We were surrounded by home upon our return, but we needed a house. Our own space. The weeks wore on. I searched for a job and eventually took what turned out to be an interim pastoral position in a small town in southwestern Montana. It was a church or a congregation that had been served previously by the gentleman who became bishop in the Oregon Synod, ultimately, Paul Swanson. Teaching job inter interviews came later, and I flew off here and there to interview. That was a good sign for us, but the wheels turned slowly, much too slowly for our liking. The kids weren't happy in school, and we were quite sure this wasn't the place that we had imagined for ourselves, for our family. But the people were really good-hearted. They were good-hearted folks, and they knew about transitions themselves. This was a company town, and for generations, the smelter jobs kept the people and the town going. Then, not too long before, not too long before we came to this community, the company decided the smelter was no longer profitable and they summarily closed and shuttered the place for good. The jobs were gone and people in droves were without jobs that they and their families had depended on for generations. What was left behind was the toxic waste. And eventually the area became one of the EPA's largest Superfund sites. This was the beginning of Rust Belt America, an America we would come as a nation to learn much more about in the years ahead. Poverty, hopelessness, depression, domestic violence, and much more were the byproducts of this hopeless state of affairs. Through the grit and perseverance of the people of that community, they survived. But I, would doubt, I, would, I doubt I would ever say they recovered. As a family, we were in transition. For a short time, we lived among people who were also in transition. Undoubtedly more heart-wrenching than ours, because we could and did move on. We both found jobs. We picked up and moved, once again, 700 miles to the east. New opportunities awaited us. But I couldn't help but think over the years about the, those people in southwestern Montana. The whole process of transition and transitioning has stayed with me ever since. Employment transitions, health transitions, location transitions, gender transitions, economic transitions, 
family transitions, life to death transitions, social transitions, and my list could go on and on and on. Some, of course, are more difficult than others. But in one way or another, transition is one of the words that I would use to describe human life, human existence. There's no recipe for how we will or should deal with them, but deal with them we must. Transitioning is a dynamic process fraught with every emotion that humans can muster. I conclude with a story about my Norwegian grandmother. I've spoken about my ancestors before. As I knew her later in life, a quite refined woman, gracious, striking with her blue-gray hair, devoted to her church and her family. I, in retrospect, have no idea how this could have happened. She was born in eastern North Dakota as one of four girls, two older and two younger. The two older sisters were much older, one of, who, one of whom eventually moved to Salem and worked for the state of Oregon. The other, along with her husband, homesteaded in northwestern North Dakota. My grandmother, my grandmother's other younger sister, was the one who died in the Spanish flu epidemic that I mentioned at the beginning. By this time, their father had abandoned the family and headed off to the Klondike to find gold. He never returned. Somewhat later, my grandmother's mother, while grandma was still a fairly young girl, abandoned her too. According to family lore, she went to Seattle to become a dance instructor. Go figure that. <laughs> My dad remembered visiting her only one time somewhere on Capitol Hill in Seattle. Grandma was farmed out to a neighboring family. Basically, orphaned by abandonment. And one of the great ironies of this was, and I had, as a kid, or as a young adult, had never spent much time in eastern North Dakota except to drive through. But when we moved to western Minnesota, a woman was serving as a receptionist <coughs> and other duties in the Senate office. Audrey was her name. She was from the family to whom my grandmother was farmed out. Strange intersections and connections. It was a tough beginning for my grandmother, to say the least. Once my immigrant grandfather earned enough money, he and his brothers headed west to claim their homesteads. Having done that, he went back, married my grandmother, and they set up their homestead in Montana. I can remember, as a kid, her telling us that in the early days, years would sometimes go by when she never left the place, never went to town. And this is remote country. 
But the pathos of this was driven home to me one summer. When my parents, who prior, I mean grandparents, had prior moved to Seattle, they went back to the farm one summer from Seattle, just after Julie and I were married. And she had a heartfelt, my grandmother had a heartfelt and frank and revealing talk with my new bride. Looking across to the high spot in the yard, she asked Julie if she knew if she could look across to this high spot and could see the green grass. Which, of course, she did. Then she asked Julie, do you know why it's green? Of course, Julie didn't. It's where I would go to cry and my tears watered the grass. That's why it's green. When I heard the story, I could only feel and ponder the pain of her transition from one hard life to another. I'm sure this kind of story has been written over and over again in human history by people who have transitioned to what they have hoped would be better lives. So, I open it up to you to think about transitions again of many different varieties some that we have seen some that we have gone through ourselves and we think about our reflective memories i'd like to quote or uh, refer here to a um if i can find it here uh, something that randy sin sent to me um a couple of weeks ago, and it's from Anthony DeMello, uh, Minor Wisdom, and it's uh, titled Myths. The master gave his teaching in parables and stories, which his disciples listened to with pleasure and occasional frustration, for they longed for something deeper. The master was unmoved. To all their objections, he would say, you have yet to understand. My dears, you have yet to understand that the shortest distance between a human being and truth is a story. Another time he said, do not despise the story. A lost gold coin is found by means of a penny candle. The deepest truth is by means of a simple story. And these are the stories of our lives and our reflective memory as we bring those and perhaps that truth to life. So, for today, some questions that I, again, throw out to you. What have been some of the important, difficult, or satisfying transitions in your life or lives? How have you assisted others in transition? In what sense is each new day, each new week, a transition unto itself. What was the town in Montana? That, uh, Anaconda. <laughs> about 23 miles or so west of Butte, America. And if you've been to Butte, you may understand the implication of that. And if you see the open pit mine there today filling up with toxic waste and water, Mined in Butte, shipped 
on their own railroad to Anaconda for the smelter, and then up to Great Falls, which had electricity, to refine it. Copper, the market fell out from underneath copper for a time. And Uh, the year we were there, um, you know, heavily Roman Catholic community, ethnic, very much like the Iron Range in northern Minnesota, ethni ethnically, uh, a lot of Eastern Europeans and so on, and a few Scandinavians there. Uh, there were two Lutheran churches, one an old ALC and an LCA congregation, and I was there um, to make sure that even though we were worshiping in two congregations, we were one parish, and after that year, the one church would actually close, and it was obvious which one it had to be. And I went to that community, uh, and I um, saw that there was a beautiful new Catholic church. So I went to speak with the priest, and he said the history of this was that in that small town of 12, 13, 14,000 people, there were three Catholic, distinct Catholic parishes with their own churches. His job was to consolidate that into one. And the public meetings were so raw that the local police had to come and just no. <laughs> shape the, the, the perimeter so that the conversations, and they built a new parish, and they had gotten over that as well. But that's part of that transition in that particular community. but the one was uh, coming home from Vietnam and uh, a big transition and uh, we were boarding our planes at midnight at Ben Law Air Force Base in Vietnam a year before there had been a rocket attack near there and a number of people had been killed so it was a tense time just wanting to get out of the country and uh, they, had, they lined us up to get on the plane and they handed each of us a brochure of why we were in Vietnam. Uh, Army brochure giving the history of the Vietnam uh, situation. And most of the guys threw that away. They had a trash barrel there and they just threw it away. And, and I threw mine away and then I said, no, this is history. I kept it. Uh, and then we got on the plane. I knew nobody on that plane. It wasn't a band of brothers. It was everybody for themselves. And there was just, and we flew from Benoit to Japan, and then Japan to Travis Air Force Base. And pretty silent on the plane, a lot of people sleeping and stuff. And as soon as that plane touched down at Travis, the wheels touched the tarmac. The, the um, flight attendant said, welcome home, boys. And there was just a big cheer went up on the plane. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, yeah, they, you know, think of all the people who served there uh, and were fortunate to come home alive or uh, somewhat whole. Um, the year we were in Anaconda, we went to, this was now how many years after <clears throat> 1975 and those years, we went to a 4th of uh, July parade just before we left Anaconda. And there were vets who were marching in a kind of group. It was painful to observe. They were not well, physically or socially, and it reminded me of the psychological and physical wreckage that many people came home with. Um, and we did not, as a country, treat the vets very well. 
Well, uh, one thing though, on, on, on my coming home, well, I didn't. I never ran into any harassment or anything. So yeah, good. So uh, yeah, I don't know if that study's ever been done in that to find out how many, yeah, uh, yeah, how much yeah, it happened. Yeah, but yeah, interesting. Other transitions you want to talk about or think about or other kinds of things. I think <clears throat> for myself, I, I would say that uh, we lived in Minnesota for 30 years, so that was a long stint having moved from university to grad school to here and there and thither and yon. But, and, and of course we had children during that time as well. But the transition from our professional lives into this next stage um, is, is not an easy one either. And I think our leaving, I mean, I grew up in Washington, so the Pacific Northwest is my home in my bones. Jim grew up in Montana. He was, he's more of a wanderer th than I am, I would say. Uh, <clears throat> but, but when we left Minnesota now, uh, almost nine years ago, uh, we moved to Montana to our cabin in uh, northwest Montana Glacier Park. And, you know, that was familiar and it felt like home in some ways, but it was different as well. And then two years later, uh, we, uh, as we had hoped to do all along, found a home here to be near our children and for me to come home to the Holy Land. Um, but but in both places, I often have felt, who am I? Um, what is it now that I do? Um, uh, how do I identify? Um, how do we make new circles of colleagues and friends in two different places? We're there in the summer, we're here in the winter, People think, gosh, you people ever settle down and really get to know a community? So that's been a that's been a challenging transition for me. And I think, you know, not to give away family secrets, but uh, you know, when you think about the 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 journey, marriage, no children, children growing up, you know. Um, and then they go to college and then they're gone and married and gone and then you quit your jobs there's a lot of together time all of a sudden again you know and how do you you cope with uh, you cope with those kinds of transitions along the way uh you know i can remember as the girls were growing up it was it was like or i don't want to use that word it was as if yeah, we were just trying to keep up with them. Jobs, keep up. And uh, uh, it was kind of, everything was on the fly. Yeah, okay, good. Bonnie? Well, I can concur with, uh, with you, Julie. Um, I think uh, I have been raised with an extremely strong work ethic. I worked for my father as a kid growing up on the weekends, so, um, and um, work, as I stated in one of the earlier sessions, I worked full time my senior year of high school, um, went to college, worked on every break. It was just, it was just the way I was raised. Um, <clears throat> had two, really, more than one career, but 30 years in the teaching education profession. And um, when I retired, I, it was lovely the first day. Uh, everybody was in school and I was able to sit down with the paper and go from cover to cover with a cup of coffee, relaxed at home. Everyone said you should always go away or 
first day of retirement when school is in session, because it'll be, well, didn't bother me in the least, but <laughs> at any rate, um, so I, I don't know, it just, it just kind of takes a period of time and transition trying to figure out what do I want to do. You know, because I thought, because Larry and I retired about the same time, I thought, oh my gosh, we're going to be together 24 hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> How is that going to go? <laughs> and um, it's really been great. Um, and um, um, I, I'm thankful that um, I volunteer to do things. I think it's extremely helpful. Um, sometimes I feel I, I'm kind of in a phase where I have to learn to say no. <laughs> um, but at any rate, it, it's, it's, it is a transition, though, mm -hmm. for sure. And uh, when uh, I have friends who enter this realm, we, we do have really wonderful conversations about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else willing to bear their soul here? <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't know what part. I part of this stuff. I everybody knows about me. I can't. You're so you can take your mask up, yeah. speak up there. Uh, part of the stuff everybody knows about me, but uh, in growing up, Phyllis and I were in Ross, North Dakota. Which is a very, very, very small town. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went to college in mine. Phyllis went to work for the, uh, the she ended up with the, with the uh, Civil Service Commander SAC of Mine and Air Force Base. And I finished school there, and then I got involved in a teacher strike, and the teacher strike was really bad, and it's, it's, it's hard louder, to understand. Larry, if you can. So. Oh, Mark, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. The teacher strike, I mean, they don't do that now, but we didn't do it quite right. There's two organizations, National Education Association and the American Federation of Teachers. Everybody belonged to the American Federation of Teachers because they were better bargaining agents than the other ones were. And um, that didn't go well, and so we went on strike. And I picketed a, a grade school up north by our house. And it just so happened that the sheriff came up there and said, well, you know, it's in violation of the judge's order not to picket, so I, one of you got have to go to, and, and I can't even remember if I was on the line at that time, but I said, well, I'll go. So I went to jail. And I was in jail for, I can't even remember now, but uh, up to two weeks. And I lost about 10 pounds in jail. But the jailer that took us in was really nice to the I mean, he felt sorry for the teacher, but that was his job. So he invited all of us cell, cellmates up in, uh, and we were different cells. Uh, I don't remember if I had a, um, uh, a two-person or three-person cell. I know on Saturday night why the, they brought in teenagers that were drunk and put them in jail. They'd fall out of their, <laughs> their racks and stuff. I mean, that was part of a learning experience. <clears throat> the jailer would also, uh, uh, kind of unknown to everybody else, he would let all the teachers come down to his basement and use his public area sauna. So <laughs> it was kind of nice, you know. I mean, we didn't get steak or anything like that, but I mean, it was. Uh, so anyway, that was really hard on us, and I went through that. My folks come down from Ross to see, visit me in jail, and it's hard on them. And uh, so I end up that they never did settle that strike. They fired all the teachers in this case. Uh, Oh, there was probably about 130 or 40. Most of them junior high teachers, very few elementary, quite a few half the senior high school went. And then so we had to find a job someplace else. And I came out here, you know, you're talking transitions now. I came out here and you know, this was hard. I got the strike going over there and I come out and I, I got a job at, as a math teacher at, uh, at Mountain View <coughs> Junior High. And uh, kids were like a year behind. I just couldn't believe it. Plus the strike was hitting me on the head and stuff. And I told Phyllis, I don't want to do this no more. 
So, uh, and then the principal called me, and I'll move you to a different school, and on and on. And I said, no, I just decided, you know, tomorrow is my last day, so I left. <coughs> then I couldn't find a job. So then I had to go to school. Then Phyllis had to go back to work. We had two kids, uh, had to get babysitters, one was in school. And, uh, but, it, but it's time. Time, you know, we can't get through this quickly. So I went back to school, ended up, I got a computer job after a, a long struggle. But I, um, I, you know, we could have gone back to North Dakota, but a lot of people go back to home. I mean, that would be a disaster. I mean, <laughs> I mean, there's nothing there. There's so much more opportunity there. Well, now we've been out here since 69. Uh, and uh, and once I got that my job with in computer stuff, I mean I really liked that. So mm -hmm. and Phyllis, because I I was going to school, she had to go back to work. Well, then she went to work too, and she retired a year before I did. But uh, it, it took a long time. So anyway, and it seems as it's unfolding. Not only is it taking a long time, but it seems like it's taking an right. extra long time and moves very slowly yeah. yeah yeah you know i mean we lived out here i was you know phyllis and i are close family people all of our i had one uncle in town but the rest of them are in north dakota and her dad had moved to seattle and so but um I, we would always for our we wanted to teach our kids family and we always went back to family and that was drive we didn't fly you know, so it was 1,300 miles to go back to my folks, and we would do that, you know, every year. Mm -hmm. Everybody else would go to Disneyland and all these places, and why don't you, well, we'll do that after mom and dad are gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, or after grandma's gone. Well, she lived longer than my dad, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We could resonate to that. We would, my folks would be in Montana. Her folks were in Anacortes or nearby every summer out and back not those are both nice places to go but it was it was always a long trip it soaked up some other things. well i'll finish with this you know i always tell my grandkids i mean they've been you know reads uh <clears throat> well he's going to be 24 i guess his or five he's going and getting his master's in leon france <clears throat> and Aaron, she graduates, she's a junior, be a senior next year. But they've been to more places in their life than you can shake a stick at. Yeah. I said, I told Reed, I said, well, you know, we didn't go anywhere for our first trip out of the country probably until uh, our 50th uh, wedding anniversary. <laughs> you know, now we've been to, you know, I, yeah. but I said, I've, I've seen all these things that Rick Steve puts on the show. I watch all of them because it's like homecoming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but uh, I said, you, you guys don't know how lucky I He ain't worked a day yet. You know, he's working a summer job, but, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's worked out. Yep. It's a trick, I guess, to work out is you have to live long enough. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Claudia? Well, I can remember after Don graduated from seminary and he he did some clinical training after graduation and then he had no job and I had no job and we had some friends from Moscow, Idaho who was a college professor at Oxford College and they were moving for him to teach at the University of Idaho and he, they called us up and said would you like to move with us? So we had their family with three boys and just Don and I and our dog. And um, Eleanor said, I can't remember if it's Eleanor or Bruce said, uh, can you drive? <laughs> and so Don drove one vehicle, I drove a vehicle, and Bruce drove a vehicle. And we moved all their belongings and our belongings, which we didn't have much, to Moscow. And then Don and I lived with my folks for a period of time before he got his first call, which was in Port Orford, Oregon, down on the South Oregon coast. 
a town of 900 people. <laughs> and Don, or we didn't see the congregation beforehand like people do now. And we went through the town of Drain and had lunch. And a gal who waited on us said, uh, it looks like you're moving. Where are you moving to? And Don said, Port Orford. Oh, that hell hole? <laughs> Welcome to Port Orford. <laughs> and we got down there, and it was like, okay, <laughs> where do we go from here? And I know that one morning, or I can't remember if it was morning, anyway, about five or six o'clock, we had somebody at our door. It was the policeman trying to get Don, who he'd done some counseling with a fellow, a young fellow in town, and they were trying to find him because he had killed somebody in a fit of anger uh, the night before. <laughs> and so they thought they knew where he was, so they wanted Don to talk him out of the place. Well, he wasn't there, but anyway. But it's just the fact that we didn't know where we were going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting, Claudia, yeah. And you know, when you start reflecting about these things, there are all kinds of experiences that are involve transitions. So, um, anybody else have a comment? Or what do? Oh, Scott. Scott. I positioned it, so I'll sit over here. <laughs> So I, real quick, three little things. I went, uh, I had the honor to go hiking on Friday with Gary Grafalner, retired minister. And he shared a few stories about transition. He and his wife just eight months ago moved into a retirement community. And he shared, you know, number one, they went probably earlier than they needed to, just so you get oriented then. And then so later you're not as disoriented. But uh, he shared with me, his colleague shared, he said, the way to transition is to hold things lightly so that when you have to let go, it's not as painful. And then he also shared, there was a native minister who did most of his work on reservations. And when he, all of a sudden, he just said, I'm not doing it anymore. And he said, why? You know? And he said, well, I've used all my words. And the Jesuits he shared have a saying that is, uh, does it give you life? And so, you know, so a lot of people step away in the discernment process. They say, you know, it's, it doesn't give me that joy, that life. So that was very helpful. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. I wonder if Larry would uh, endorse the dissenter's jailhouse diet. Ten pounds in two weeks sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Those are, those are uh, wise words uh, that you relay to us, <clears throat> Scott. Our, our time is about up. Again, I'd simply like to thank you for this opportunity. You, you realize this isn't the kind of thing I normally do, but it, it seems appropriate uh, in light of, well, our gray hair, our isolation, time to use reflective memory. I am interested in the whole business of memory generally, uh, not from a neurological point of view, but how we construct memory and how those stories may relate a word of truth to us. Thanks for coming. Hello. And uh, they've been sitting in their office for a long time. She's five years or something.